It's time for Drummer Nation. Dave Maddox is an English-born rock and folk drummer. Dave played with several jazz bands before joining the influential British folk rock band Fairport Convention, with whom he worked on and off from 1969 until 1997. Along the way, Dave worked with Paul McCartney, Elton John, George Harrison, Jimmy Page, and Jethro Tull. In 1998, Dave moved to Massachusetts, where he is a sought-after studio musician, record producer, and member of the band Super Genius. My interview with Dave Maddox, next on Drummer Nation. Hi, this is Stanton Moore. I've been playing and teaching drums for over 30 years. My site, Stanton Moore Drum Academy, is the perfect online drum learning platform for any level drummer to learn how to play the drums the same way I did. I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of you as subscribers on the site, and I think we're going to have a lot of fun. Welcome to another edition of Drummer Nation, and today it is my pleasure and honor to have as a guest Dave Maddox. Thank you for doing the show, Dave. How are you? I'm good, Michael, and I appreciate you asking me to do this. Um, I'm flattered to be in such uh, a to be in your company and to be in the company of the other people that you've had on on the, on your uh, on your on your show. Well, you're too kind, and I Thank certainly you. appreciate it. Now, um, you're from the UK, I know. Is that right? That's correct. And so I don't like to do a lot of history with guys because there's generally a lot of stuff out there already for you. But we do need to do some of that stuff. So you came, you came up in the UK right around the same time rock and roll and the whole thing was starting to happen. Is that right? I I started playing my first professional job was in the back end of the 60s. And it was playing. I'd, I'd gone through the, the 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 kind of the usual kind of rock and roll things that that, that young kids, you know, my peer group did. Um, there was a band in England called the Shadows, which the nearest thing over here would have been the Ventures, mm -hmm. and they were the big thing until the Beatles came along, and then the Beatles came along and changed everything. Blah blah blah. Uh, and my first pro job was um, working in a kind of a Lawrence Welk dance band. That was my first professional job, uh, playing for um, strict tempo uh, ballroom dancing, that kind of stuff. And then at the weekends, this was a residency in a large ballroom. But then uh, at the weekends, we'd play the the dance music during the week, and at the weekends, we'd play the uh, <clears throat> pop music of the time. And then I did that for about three or four years. And then how, I joined, how old were you at this period? I'm uh, in the back end of my teens. Okay. And then I joined and then I, I was fortunate uh, and I, I, I auditioned and got a job with a band called Fairport Convention. And then that's when things kind of started to move ahead for me. Very important band. But let's talk about those early days because that was a new genre that was emerging, right? I mean, didn't you start as a jazzier, big bandish, reading styles, tempos, dance well, band kind of approach? Well, that's that was my first professional job. Yeah, was that kind of dance band? Um, it wasn't very, it wasn't very jazzy, but it had. Um, because it was playing, it was as I say, it was like a Lawrence Well thing. It, it the players, including yours truly, at a very tender age, had aspirations towards that genre and listened to that music. But I wouldn't say it was jazz. It was. <laughs> it's a word I'm sure you've heard before. Occasionally, it was jazzy. But I wouldn't call it. I wouldn't call it a jazz uh, ensemble by any stretch of the imagination. But I, 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 I certainly was very keen on that music at a very tender age, and, and continue to be. Yeah. That's what I was touching on. Is that yeah. the early drummers coming up? The prior to to 
that period, the great drummers were jazz drummers, right? Yeah. So I imagine who who were you listening to back then? Well, back then I was I was incredibly green, but bef- uh, 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 and I'll try and keep this concise and not send send the people watching this into a deep coma. But before I got the the job, the professional job in the dance band, I was a um, a spotty teenager working in London's biggest drum shop, which was called Drum City, which was kind of London's version of the pro drum shop in in, in Hollywood, in, in LA. Sure. And I had a great boss, and he really, really hit me to good players, good music, good gear, because, I, I, I mean, at that age, for all of us, um, I, I'm sure we nearly all of us would agree, we're in sponge mode. We're, mm-hmm. you know, it's mm-hmm. kind of, oh, oh, you're going to, because we know, we think we know everything, but we don't. And it, I, I, he was really good and, uh, and got me listening to the right people. Um, obviously, the obvious ones, the Morellos and the, and the Riches, but then he started turning me on to uh, you know, th- where that came from and everything from Sonny Payne to to Blakey to, you know, and even at that very young age. I mean, a lot of it was kind of over my head, but I realized that it that it wasn't, um, let's put it this way, that, that it wasn't all chops and, and you know, there, 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 was, there was a lot to it. So that mm-hmm. was, and, and he, uh, that guy, his name, a wonderful guy, his name was Johnny Richardson, my boss at the drum shop. And he also taught me a lot about the instrument. I mean, I was lapping calf heads and repairing drums. And right. so I, I, had, I had this kind of um, penchant for the instrument as well as the music, which is, as you know, is continued to this day. Sure. Now that everybody knows that drum shop as the famous place where Ringo got his first Ludwig kit. Yep. And so I imagine that the the drummers of the day in that new emerging genre were were coming through that drum shop. Everybody, everybody came through that shop. I got to meet a lot of the rock guys. I mean, I didn't meet Ringo, but um, I knew uh, you know to talk to in the shop. Um, the session guys, they were the guys that were really the inspiration for me. A lot of the session guys, the jazz guys and the rock guys, uh, Moon, uh, Mooney, and uh, I knew Mitch quite well. Uh, Mooney and Mitch and, and, and Ginger would all come in the shop. Uh, my, one of my big heroes around that time was a wonderful big band session drummer uh, called Kenny Clare. Oh, sure, yeah. C-L-A-R-E, not not Kenny Clark right. and Kenny was a big inspiration and would come into the shop and I'd always be trying to pick his brains and my boss would just leave the guy alone for Christ's sake. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, how do you get that sound and what's that drum feel that, you know, how do you get that? How do you tune the, you know, so. Uh, but yeah. those guys you just they, mentioned. Uh, yeah, uh, they all came in the shop. Yeah. Those guys you mentioned, Mitch and Bonzo and Keith Moon and Ginger, they were all influenced by the jazz players of the day as well. I think what our symbols uh, brought to the Sabian uh, family is that there is more, lots more hand hammering. They were willing to try it, and I think we came out with, with a great product that, uh, that is a great musical instrument. Memphis Drum Shop is the world's premier provider of percussion instruments. With six showrooms of gear, MySymbol.com, the Memphis Gong Chamber, and a first-rate repair department, turn to Memphis Drum Shop for all your percussion needs. Um, players like Mitch Mitchell and um, Ginger would come into that shop, and they, Ginger was a little older, but Mitch was, a, was very much a, um, an Elvin freak. He would come in and he'd be showing us Elvin licks on the counter with with sticks. Oh, I've just got the new Coltrane, you should hear it, blah, 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 blah. He was completely into that. And 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 I think not all of them, but 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 not all of them, but but some of the definitely, yeah, some of the rock drummers. I mean, Ringo wasn't. Ringo Ringo, I think he listened to it, but he was definitely not um a jazz influenced drummer. But 
just going down the ringer path very briefly, one of the reasons I think he sounds so good, he was a little bit older than the guys, and he was versatile. I, I, I expect the people who are Ringo fans, Beatle fans, have heard the Beatles at the BBC uh, recordings, and he's playing, he's playing kind of swing things and you know latin slightly latin things i mean they probably sound incredibly unhip now but compared against a lot of his peers who were straight 4-4 four, four rock drummers you know playing with all due respect kind of surf beats ringo was definitely ahead of the pack but oh yeah but going back to the guys that were coming in the shop yeah so i was i was again i i i without hoping boring people i was exposed to to an enormous range and i've always had a pretty kind of wide take on music i mean obviously i've ended up in a in a kind of an area but i've always you know i mean i, I for example for me paul motion is, is as important to me as as keltner is you know i mean i anyway I'll let you get a word in, Michael. <laughs> no, no, I understand. For people who may not know, Paul Motion was part of the great Bill Evans, uh, first great trio in the 60s, where they began to break up the time and become more interactive and more in the moment with one another as a mutual conversation, as opposed to a part that's, yes. that's played. So uh, I, I, I'm glad you mentioned him. i just like to throw those little uh, explanations in for some, maybe some kids who are watching right. who don't know. Um, so what you became involved with this band Fairport, I'm sorry, Fairport Convention uh -huh. after a while. Yep. And, um, that was a very seminal band that sort of bridged these gaps we're talking about with jazz influence and rock and folk and pop and all that. What was your approach in that band? Well, it, the band when I initially, before I was in it, it was playing a lot of American singer-songwriter material. And it had, the band had kind of an ascetic, hit an ascetic brick wall. And it felt that, I understand, and I. It took me a time to get this, but it the band, the guys in the band, and the singer in the band felt that it was best to leave American music to the Americans, and they wanted to come up with a music that 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 that, that was their own, that was English, still with bass guitars and drums and things, but the the, the where the core material didn't owe its influence to Americana and, uh, and America. And it, and it kind of dragged traditional English folk music kicking and screaming into the, into the 20th century. A couple of the guys really had this love affair with, with traditional English folk music. I guess we were trying to do, I don't think it was too conscious, but we, it, there was a, a discussion about the, ba the Fairport trying to do an English version of what the band had done. In other words, to absorb their history and their origins and try and bring it into, and, and trying to make make it English. And- You're talking about the group, the band? Yeah, the group, the band. With yeah, Levon the, Helm, yeah. The, with Levon, the, the way those songs and that material evoked an American history, and, and I think we we the Fairports tried to do the same thing for English folk music, mm -hmm. uh, and again, long story short, for the first kind of nine months I was in that band, on an aesthetic level, I didn't really understand it. I was literally just responding to the music. Um, I heard the songs and the dance tunes that they played, and I just tried to play something appropriate. But when I when the light bulb really started to glow about nine months after I was in the band, it had a profound effect on how I approach my instrument and how I heard music and the music that I started, that I then continued to listen to. I stopped being 
enamoured, which I had been up to that point, completely on a technical level. I was all about I was all about technique and chops and speed and how clever this or that or the other was. And it, when the light bulb really started to shine br- bright, it just flipped me 180 degrees. And 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 it was the, probably one of the most, without getting too arty farty about it, one of the most profound things in, in my musical life. It really completely changed how I heard music. I stopped being enamoured by technique and started to look beyond that and listen to what what was being said. If That's a it. great explanation of that whole approach. And I think it's consistent with what most great drummers come through that, you know, where they, they're, they're enamoured of the technique and they want to learn the, the instrument. Mm. But eventually when you're on a session, you're just trying to help the song, right? The song or the piece of music, yeah, you get less, one one gets less concerned about trying to impose what one thinks is <laughs> one's thing on a piece of music and you become much more concerned about the music itself, how it's structured, the shape of it, the composition. The, you know, like for me, as a, I started off as a piano player, uh, the composition, what the lyrics are saying, you know, as opposed to, and I know it's an easy shot and, a, and a, a, it's, it's an easy shot, but, you know, as opposed to, oh, I can't wait to get that new lick that I've learned, just learned in on the, on, the, on the end of the chorus or, the, you know, that whole method of thinking. You know, like when, when I, 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 I I'm, like to think that I'm getting to a point now where I think I'm getting reasonably good at being an accompanist rather than trying to, you know, I, I'm sure, I would imagine, Michael, it's something that you must get asked about often about, and I hear it from younger players, and I understand it because it's, you know, it's it's part of the growing process, but, you know, how do you come up with a signature sound? Well, A, I think it comes, and B, in my case, I'd, I'd like to think that I don't really have one because I change things around. I don't change things around um, on a gig, for example, the way Steve Jordan does with his snare drums, which is very, very cool. It's great. But on a studio, I, I'm trying to, I'm, A, I'm trying to play the part that I think is fits in but i'm also trying to think of oh yeah that that drum or that symbol or the way i've got these tuned that doesn't really fit so this whole thing about a signature sound it, it's i don't know I, I i just don't think it's it's that important and the, the uh, um, forgive me let me lead on from that that Please whole do. thing about um that philosophy about hey it's my it, it, you know I've heard it from some guys who go into a studio or in a certain situation. Hey, this is my sound. Deal with it. Um, in some respects, I understand it um, because it leads to a certain individuality, which I think is is obviously cool. I mean, we don't want to we don't want to be this kind of a big amorphous slob, but at the same time, on the negative side of that philosophy, I think it's kind of selfish. Because it's saying I'm more important than what's going on around here. So I've always had a bit of a love-hate thing with that thinking about about looking at sound that way. Hey, it's my sound. Deal with it. Now, you know, I can shoot myself in the foot with that argument when we talk about Bonzo because Bonzo would just go, hey, this is what it is. Stick the microphone there. But he had a certain amount of success before he got to that point, plus he knew how to play and how to tune, and he knew what worked and what didn't. So, yeah, but I think going into being a freelance player, 
no matter the instrument and saying, this is it, deal with it, with that kind of attitude, I think is kind of selfish. I mean, you know, we're all trying to retain our own identity, but when when that be, when when one perceives that as being more important than the gen the bigger picture, I think that's I, I'm, I'm yeah. <laughs> well, very well stated. That's that's wonderful. So when you had the opportunity to work with some of these legends like uh, Paul McCartney or you know uh, George Harrison, Jimmy Page, Elton John. I imagine this came into play, right? Did they, how would that go down? Would they tell you what to play, tell you how to tune? They left it up to you, but then you made choices based on putting the music first. Is that fair? I don't think, I don't think any of those people said more than a couple of words. You know, it's like, like, like my relationship with, I'm fond of saying this. I've, 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 and, and if I'm repeating this to people who've heard it before, I apologize. But my relationship with Richard Thompson um, for 50 years, I think once Richard said to me, yeah, DM, it's more like a kind of a this kind of vibe. And I went, oh, you mean like this? He went, yeah. And that was mm -hmm. in 50 years. And with mm -hmm. the people that you've mentioned, pretty much, yeah, they'll go, might go, uh, it's more kind of, I go, Oh, okay. I think I was barking up the wrong musical tree. More like this, yeah. Basically, mm -hmm. what happens, and I was very fortunate, is 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 that trust thing, right? And 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 now being in a position where I'm occasionally on the other side of the glass, so to speak, with the production thing. And I'm sure, again, this is, I'm not stating anything kind of revolutionary here. I'm, this is something that is, 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 relatively speaking, is commonplace. You, you don't book a musician or ask a musician to play with you and then tell them what to play, no matter the genre. You might guide them, mm -hmm. but you don't tell, you know, because that way then you, you, you know, you've got the wrong if you're not, if you, if if what that person drum guitar trumpet whatever, and it's not a written piece where every single note is written out. If you're not hearing what you want, then that's that's the wrong player. It might be a fantastic he or she might be a fantastic player, but if it's not what you're hearing, and one of the things that about uh, 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 getting the years behind one is you learn that. And you adjust accordingly. Mm -hmm. like, like one of the things, <laughs> one of the things I'm fond of fond of saying is, is 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 you know you get you get the right players in the studio and you go here's the song, it's this kind of a thing. Maybe stay out of the first verse. There you go. Broad broad step. Well, to tie this into what we talked yeah. about earlier, uh, you mentioned Paul Motion with yeah. Bill Evans. The second great Bill Evans trio had my my friend Marty Morell in it. And oh, I asked Marty about the, 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 the stylistic stuff we were talking about earlier, the highly right. interactive and and the conversational approach and all. I said, is that something you guys discussed mm -hmm. on or off the bandstand? And he's with Eddie Gomez, a great bass player. And he yeah. said, never. Right. We never talked about that. That was understood. That's why he called me. Right. You know, Wonderful. essentially. I, I, I love hearing things like that that, in, that endorse something that I feel fairly strongly about. It's, it's yeah, that's, that's the thing. Yeah, I like what that person does. I think this is going to work. Yeah, and when you, when you get those years behind you, 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 you understand that. Mm -hmm. you know, it, I, there was a... a <laughs> It was a great, I don't know if you saw this, Michael, there was a great J.R. Robinson thing recently, and he said about a, a kind of midway career thing, he got called for something, and this person goes, okay, so on the intro, I wanted you to do a thing with a hi-hat, and it comes down like this, and then and on the second and third bar, I've got this little drum fill that goes, to, and the bass drum fill goes, this, and when it gets to the, the, the seventh bar of the chorus, you could, uh, and J.R. goes, uh, hang on, 
you're you're going to love what I'm going to do. <laughs> Which was one of the greatest things I, I've I've heard because you know if you want I mean, that's I, why they called him in the first place. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's it's, it's freaking J.R. Robinson for for Christ's sake. He's one of the greatest. Don't you know lay the song out? You know it's, the verse is this long, the intros are blah blah blah. Lay the thing out. Sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, when I, I I don't I think this is commonplace. But, um, when I write charts out for songs, I don't write drum parts out. I write the structure out. Mm -hmm. I write, you know, intro, no intro. It goes to this or it's this. The bridge is this long. And then I wait and see what happens when we start playing. So I know where the thing's going. But I don't start writing it. If it's got certain accents and hits, yeah, of course I put those in. But generally I'm more concerned about, yeah, another one of my heroes, you know, Peter Erskine. Good friend of mine. Another, another oh, a monster! I'm, I'm, I'm so proud to, to, to actually say that I actually know Peter. He's an absolute hero, man. He's good. Another Same. great quote. Great. I'm, I'm, I know he's a friend of yours. Great quote from Peter. He said, "I'm not. I don't get booked because I can play, you know, quadruple paradiddles at blah blah blah." He said, "I get booked because I." perceive and look at the arc of a song does it go like this does it go like this does it go like this what's the shape you know that's that's more important than than than, than all that i mean that's Absolutely. That, that's Absolutely. that stuff is great i'm not i'm not anti technique despite what some people say about me oh you know you're you're, you're anti-technique i've heard that people say that about me and i'm not i just think sometimes it seems to take precedence over making music everything has to serve the music it's 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 a cliche but these days but yeah 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 Th those are fantastic explanations and i appreciate that um, so eventually you moved to, to the United States. What, what brought that about? A couple of, th two things kind of in tandem. One, I was working here much more, uh, and things were just kind of dropping off in England, but I'd always had a, say a love affair, but I've, I'd always been, keen on coming here and, and and the more i worked here the more it appealed to me uh, there's a whole different aesthetic thing that took place outside of the music that made me want to come here um and that's for maybe another time and another, another interview on a, 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 a different subject but on a musical level i was working here more and was enjoying it here more. And the third reason was that I wanted to be in, I wanted to work in situations where I could start to loosen up. I'd spent a lot of my life trying to be incredibly concise. Um, really, really concise from a time point of view, and I wanted to. I wanted to get some more grease into my playing. I wanted to get. I wanted to retain the. My, I mean, my time is okay. It's not great. It's it's okay. Uh, but but I wanted to. I wanted to get some kind of. I wanted to get some looseness, some some grease into it, and I and I and part of the thinking was, well, I need to be, I need to I need to be closer to where I perceive that stuff comes from. Now, you could take that thinking to an extreme and say, well, then friggin' go to New Orleans, but that would have been too much of a culture shift. But coming to New England, to me, was a great 
compromise, a really good compromise. In other words, I'm closer to, I'm going to be closer to where I think I'm going to get what I want, but I'm not going to feel like a fish out of water. I'm not, you know, which I would have done if I had gone to New Orleans on a on a, on a lot of levels. I mean, I would, I, I love it down there. I mean, I've got great, I've got a small handful of great musician friends, but I know that on a cultural level and a lot of other things, I would have felt kind of like this. But whereas New England, it was is kind of down the middle for me. That's a good point. New Orleans is my hometown, and I understand precisely what you're saying. Oh, really? It's so such you're... an unusual rhythmic thing you know it's when did you move? when well, did i you... left as a kid so oh, I, okay but when i lived in la and i was working people would always say man i hear some of that new orleans stuff in there and i oh. never really quite knew what it was till i studied with some people and 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 then i got hooked up with stanton moore who introduced oh. me to all the the uh we were business partners in a symbol company oh, that's he right. introduced me to all the drummers in new orleans and i mean i love those guys but yeah. but it's a whole different bag yeah than everything else but it's those influential guys, but you yes know, you can't use it in everything you know no you can't use it in everything but but the more the more i listen to that stuff the more yeah it's like i know what you mean about touching a fundamental grease funk slop whatever you want to call it um uh, speak to that a little bit what are you what are you getting at when you call it grease I did an album in the front end of the 90s that I think a few people liked. Uh, it was with a band called XTC, and, and the album was called None Such. And I read a review of it, and it said, worst effects, Mattox delivers, but he couldn't swing if his ass <laughs> That's I, not fair. I well, was listening to that music today. It's great and I, I listened to it, and I, and and John Martin, uh, M M A R T Y N, who's a, a who's a who was a wonderful. He's not with us anymore. A wonderful, wonderful musician. I did one of his early records, a thing called Solid Air. And later on, John was talking about English folk music, and he said, "It's so four square." And those two things. I realized that that was, I was, it was too, I'd like to, with all due respect to my German friends, I'd like to think that it wasn't too Germanic, but it was definitely, I just felt that I was stiff. I mean, you know this, man. When you get into this whole thing about time, it's, it's a rabbit hole. It's insane. It's an absolute rabbit hole. And there's guys out there now, no names, no pack drill, who play perfectly in time, perfectly right. in time. Right. But it just sounds like a machine. And there's other guys that play perfectly in time, and, and it makes you want to – it swings like an MF. I think of guys like Keith Carlock when you say that. Oh, yeah. He's, he's got perfect time, but he's it's got that time. swampy, it's swampy, got, nasty, yeah. dirty thing in there. It's too. got that thing in it. Yeah. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I realized I was, I felt like I was the wrong side of it. And I, and I, 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 I thought, this is something that I've, I've got to work on. And I, and it isn't something with, with all due respect to great teachers everywhere that you sit down with a book and you, right. this is something that you have to, be exposed to you have to work with musicians who get have that sensibility you have mm-hmm. to you have to it has to be for want of a better cliche a hands-on scenario how would we describe that is it kind of like some wiggle room within you know quantized is perfect right yeah to, to the 16th note or 32nd note this is not getting faster or slower mm-hmm. it's not becoming on or uh, ahead or behind the beat a little bit it's just Erskine describes it as mastering the spaces between the notes. Would that's, you agree with that? Yeah, that's that's the other thing. That's and that's a variation on that was a again was a, a, a for, for me a, a a gradual revelation if there's such a thing. 
the realizing that playing that whole thing is playing four quarter notes is the hardest thing in the world. Our friend Peter Erskine talks about if he plays four quarter notes and he's thinking eighth notes, or he plays four quarter notes and he's thinking triplets, triplets. there's yeah. a difference. Oh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and the thing that I that I that that I started to discover and started to get a handle on, and nowadays it's commonplace, but I started to get a handle on it. Um, how old was I? When did I come over and do that? There was a. There's a. Uh, do you know um, John Hyatt? You know who John Only Hyatt? Only by reputation. Right. Yes. Hyatt. Hyatt did a great album called "Bring the Family" with Keltner. Kuda and um, uh, um, wonderful bass player, English bass player, whose name I'm, I can't believe I'm blanking on it. Anyway, I don't remember. I got asked to do the follow up and I did it and it never came out. But when I did it, there was a couple of tracks that had that thing. And this is this is a long time ago. So this would be kind of maybe 30, 25, 30 years ago. I know I was, was it was early days for me. Um, and it had that thing where it wasn't, it wasn't straight eights and it wasn't shuffle. It wasn't a triplet thing. And I started to get a handle on that. And I remember saying to John Hyatt, is that the kind, and John said, I live there. <laughs> And I talked to Jim about that and and, and Keltner about that. And, and, and I mean, he's he, he, he's he totally he exemplary. That, he, had that, he had that shit. Absolutely. Yeah. Before most of us were wearing, when most of well, people like me was wearing shorts. But I mean, <laughs> Jim's got that down. But that's that's something that I thought, yeah, I, 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 I need to I need I need to work on that. I, I, I need to work. That's one of the areas that, that is indicative of what I'm referring to and what you, you, you mm -hmm. understand. Yeah. But you know what's great, man? You're not 25 years old anymore, and you're still working on something new, you know, oh. working on some different, interesting, advancing your playing, advancing your thinking, or at least morphing it to fit whatever you want to do. But that, that lifelong student thing is, is really oh. important, don't you think? It's and it's scary when you, when you, yeah. I mean, if you if if you've got a passion for it and you start and you go down that path, it's scary because you realize you just you you never. But that's part of the that's part of the again cliche time. That's part of the enjoyable journey. But yeah, you realize that you 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 never stop. There's, I, you know, some some people have said, oh, you know. But you've played with blah blah blah, and I go, yeah, I have. But there's, I could point you to uh, several dozen guys who've got resumes twice my size, twice as important, and they're the they're the ones that I look up to just as much as the guy down the road who's got a thing that I can't do. Mm -hmm. So this whole thing about kind of you know, hey. I'm, you know, yeah, you never arrive. I want, we have a mutual friend, Dom Famolaro, and he tells oh, the story of Jim Chapin when right. he was on his deathbed. I'll make it short. Literally on his deathbed, uh, uh, Dom's going to visit him in the hospital. And he up the, in the elevator, he runs into his doctor. And his doctor says, you know, you might want to tell your goodbyes. He's in a bad way. And I don't know how much longer he's going to last. So he gets out of the elevator and he hears taps of a pad. And he goes to Chapin's room and he's sitting in his bed with a pad. And he says, look, man, I think I got my left hand a little better. I think it's a little faster. And he died like that night or the next morning. So oh, bless him. Oh. <laughs> doesn't that say so much about what we're talking about here? Yeah, we're all trying to we're all trying to just get better ourselves and 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 broaden this, yeah. But that's a beautiful story. Dom's a Dom's a sweetheart, man. He's a good guy. He's a great guy. Yeah. Um, how about today? What What are you up to now? Um, I got a little production gig which kicked off just before COVID kicked in. So mm -hmm. that's been keeping me busy because that, that meant doing all the charts, and I'm also playing all the keyboard parts on it. So and I'm, that's ongoing. Um, 
we dip into that every are couple they, of weeks. Are they your tunes? No, they're not my tunes. It's another. It's another. Uh, it, it's a. It's a. It's a thing. It's a local. It's a local thing. Um, uh, they're not my chart. They're not my songs. But I've been. I've been writing out the charts for the for the musicians and making sure everyone's on the same page. And we've been cutting it. I don't have a studio at home, but I have a very a good very good friend that I've been working with for. 15 plus years now who's got a home studio and it's very modest but he is very good and we do a lot of work there we track all the drums over there i've been so i've been working on that i've had a handful a small handful of remote sessions where it's been just me and the engineer mm -hmm. so you know and and the one that i did last week was way out in the boondocks and the guy was super, super careful. So it was just the two of us. And as I said to someone when they were asking me, what's your age? And it just you and the drums. I said, well, A, everyone's doing it. B, I say everyone's doing it. Relatively speaking, everyone's doing it. And I said, C, it's not my favorite way of making music, but I know how to do it. And it's better than not playing. It beats Until, not making music. Yeah, That's what we all miss right now, right? Yeah. Anybody who's made their living their whole lives as a musician. As a musician, the interaction, yeah. <sighs> We're yeah. kind of like, yeah, I mean, I can play all day, but it's not the same as having a band to work with. As a musician in England who is a friend of mine, and he's one of the greatest musicians I'm fortunate to know, um, he's kind of like England's Emil Richards. He mm -hmm. does all the film scores. But the he I'm talking about like the Bonds and the and the Pirates, and he does the percussion on all of those. And we got talking about this whole proliferation of everybody sitting in their bedroom playing. He goes, "Oh, you mean karaoke drumming?" <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of what it is, but it's good practice, you know. It's, it's well, it's good practice, but it's it and it is and and and. It lacks all the essentials we've been talking about. Yeah, it's 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 because I don't know. I I I'm trying not to come across like some grizzled grizzled old fart guy. Oh, the young people of today, you know. No, you've been very very <laughs> candid and very open and very today. I mean, uh, I don't think of you that way at all. Now, are you teaching a little bit? No, no. I I I. Uh, uh, not last year, the year before, and the couple of years before that, <clears throat> I taught the five-week course at Berkeley, okay. but that but that stopped. Uh, they haven't asked me to do it, and the, the last time they did ask me to do it, it coincided with F F Fairport have a music festival in England every August uh, out in the Oxford out in Oxfordshire. Uh, it's a three-day music festival. They get about, you know, they have all kinds of people. They've had um, Steve Winwood's done it. Alice Cooper's done it. Folky people. And a few years ago, they had the 50th anniversary. So I got invited back as a guest mm -hmm. to play some songs with them. And it coincided with the Berkeley thing. So I I turned it down. And I think when it came to the following year, they thought, well, he couldn't do it last year. So they <laughs> <laughs> didn't ask me so but i have a i have a, a very small handful of students that 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 come to me but not no not the short answer is not a lot not a right. lot of teaching no and do you have any favorite uh, videos of you on youtube what do you think of that whole youtube thing i mean first of all we get to see great stuff that we don't have any other way of seeing things that happened a long time ago on the other hand nobody's getting paid for any of that mm. What's your take on that? I think it's a good educational tool for aspiring musicians to find out what key players do. The, the downside, I heard, I, was, I think it was Terry. Do you know Terry Bissett? Oh, sure, he, yes. Yeah, Terry is a great guy. Yeah, he's a good friend. He used to work for Steve Maxwell's shop. Now he's back with Ludwig. Right. And we were talk I did a couple of clinics for him last year, one down in New York and another one at his Nashville shop. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about the clinic thing. 
and he was saying that they're really dropping off. And I said, well, why is that? He said, I I've heard so many kids coming up say, oh, I, I don't really, I can't really be bothered to go to a clinic. I can sit, I can see that on YouTube. So that's the downside of it. Yeah. It, 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 Yes, it's a great educational tool. It's a pain in the posterior that nobody's getting any money out of it. And don't get me started on Spotify or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But it's a pain. But it's a great educational tool. But don't. The only thing I would say is don't let it. At the risk of stating the obvious. Don't let it become a substitute when things eventually return to right. whatever normalcy is or some variation on it from now that's no substitute for seeing a bunch of musicians in person you don't i know i know it's obvious but i think it, it no it needs to be it's stated. Worth repeating yeah it's there's no substitute for being there right haven't you yeah. seen great artists where you just can't believe that that's happening right in front of you Oh. They're actually really there, and that music is that incredible that it moves you so much, and you're in the moment, and it's a whole thing that comes over you. It's not just what you get on a video. It, it's not. It's not. Yeah, it's not one or two dimensional. Yeah, I mean, I've, there's some of the concerts that I've been fortunate to see. Uh, one of the first variations on Weather Report with Eric Gravatt. Oh, Ronnie, I, yeah, I saw Ronnie. That. Ronnie Scott's in London. I saw that. I band. was, I was, I was like three rows back. Dom, uh, was it? I think, might have been Dom and Romeo on percussion. I think it was Wayne, Wayne, and and, and I mean, it was before yeah. Jacko, yeah. Oh yeah, pre, oh, well pre Jacko, yeah. oh, well pre Jacko. Yeah. Uh, that's just great. Well, anything else you want to talk about? I think. Uh, You've been very candid, and we've gotten into the meat of being a drummer. You know, that's more interesting to me, and I think my viewers, than what kind of sticks you play. And you know, oh, I can go down that path at a moment's notice. <laughs> I'll, talk, I'll bore, I'll bore your 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 listeners, your 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 lookers. I can bore the pants off them. I, I, I'll, I go, a... I'll go down that. I'll talk. I'll talk. My friend, great drummer Jerome Dupree. Um, uh, it, 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 we we call it the wingnut factor. Yeah, I'll, right, right. I'll go I'll go down the wingnut factor like at a at a heartbeat. I'll talk I'll talk I'll talk bearing, bearing edges and and send everybody into a coma in a heartbeat. <laughs> I so. used to have a friend who would come by my gigs and he was so into <laughs> gear that like the bass player would go pull his quarter gun. Look, man, quarter inch. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah. I had I had an interviewee an interviewee yeah a few weeks ago who said uh, don't you want to know about my gear and I said no <laughs> 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 and I was in the gear business you know I mean I, know. I yeah. totally get it I think and that's where we met wasn't it when when you were I met you at the Chicago Drum Show the where Chicago you, you did a very great uh, presentation that was witty and funny as hell. Oh, thank you. About, was that, that was the, the tuning. The, oh, was it about the was it the tuning thing, or was it that thing where we were talking about the beat boom? Yes, the beat boom. The, the beat boom. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was. I, I. I. I'm afraid the the uh, the little devil on the shoulder. I mean, we've got one on each side, and the devil on 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 my shoulder loves to burst the balloon about Dave Clark because this whole thing about oh Dave Clark was something. Yeah, he didn't play on any of the records he was a businessman and, and, was a, and evidently great, a pretty damn good one. Oh, right. incredibly good there was a great um series of british tv shows i think it called six five special this is 60s and the world and his brother played on those damn shows all the americans came over um uh, they're like the pop acts and the r b acts and everybody did that show he bought the rights to all those shows. Mm. So he, I mean, I don't even know, God bless him, whether he's still with us. But yeah, he bought the rights to all those shows. So when people talk to me about, what do you think of Dave Clark? He's a great businessman. <laughs> well, that's okay. He's great at something. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, it, it is what it is, yeah. yeah. All right, man. Well, I hope we hook up again in the I hope sometime so too. pretty soon. That came I hope out so wrong. Too. That didn't sound right. I hope we hook up in person. <laughs> 
and uh, buy a beer or a lunch or a coffee or a dinner or something. But uh, thank you so much for doing my show. It's my honor to have you. Oh, uh, Michael, thank you. I, like I said, I, I really appreciate you asking, and 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 uh, I'm flattered to be in such in your company and in, in such good company with all all the great guests you've had on. Man. Thank you. I agree with you about the guests. But I, I appreciate that. Okay, take care. Talk to you soon. All right, man. You got it. Thank you.